Alrighty, so um, today we are still talking about sedimentary rocks indirectly, sort of um, a pre, think of this as a prequel, I suppose, to sedimentary rocks. Um, we uh, are, are, are making the required materials, okay? And um, weathering and erosion are two terms that, that you guys, we talked about this a little bit with the rock cycle, two, two terms you guys are familiar with, but quite often uh, intermingle. And it's not entirely your fault. Uh, but you need to leave this class with an understanding that um, the word weathering and the word erosion do mean two uh, different things. They work together, all right? Um, and often one is happening exactly at the same time as the other one, and, and I think that's a large part of the problem. So this, this, this title slide really could say it all. That'd be nice, wouldn't it, if we just had a one-slide lecture? Um, but weathering erosion and deposition, making, moving, and putting down sediments. There's three definitions right there. All right. Weathering is making sediments. Super short, non-scientific definition there. Erosion is moving sediments. And pretty much everyone knows what deposit means, but, you know, to put something down, make a deposit in the bank, so on and so forth. Um, but we, of course, are talking about deposits like in a, a stream, if you've ever stood uh, on a bank of a stream and on a bunch of, whole bunch of gravel, for example, that might be on uh, one of the bends or turns of a stream. That's a deposit. It was laid there by the stream. The stream brought that gravel from somewhere else. That's erosion. And somewhere before that, uh, a bigger rock was broken down into those pieces of gravel. That's the weathering. See, lecture all done. No, only 19 more slides to go. All right. So, just a little defining here. Um, this might sound a little redundant coming right off of the sedimentary rocks lecture, but that's okay. A little redundancy isn't bad. Helps with memory. So, sediments can be a couple things. They can be fragments of pre-existing materials, right? And those can be either organic or inorganic. <coughs> and then don't forget there is that weird kind of sedimentary rock that actually grows. So we could also refer to sediment as material that precipitates out of solution. Remember, chemical sedimentary rocks. And in that case, again, it's always inorganic. So just a couple of examples in case you really aren't picking up on the groove here. Sediment can be rock material, mineral material, plant material, or animal material. I don't think that, I think that pretty much captures all the categories, right? Uh, Man-made. Hasn't made the list yet. I'm still grumpy at one of my teachers years ago. Um, we had a huge... Uh, I guess a tire dump really isn't, there's no better word for it. Just a huge pile of tires that the city decided over decades, I have to imagine, just to keep in one spot. And uh, I don't know if we had just gotten done talking about how swamps and whatever make coal. And I said, well, what kind of a, a deposit do you think all of this rubber from like the tire plant in town here, you know, what would that turn into? And he just kind of looked at me like it was the stupidest question he'd ever heard of. But... Now here we are all these years later worrying about all this plastic that's never going to go anywhere. Um, you know, ge uh, geology students in uh, 200 years might be learning about plasticite or something like that. Who knows? Um, but, uh, you know, we, we eventually will have uh, some man-made material, I have to imagine, uh, showing up eventually. But for now, this is the list.
Boulder Cobble Pebbles and Silk Clay. Rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? Uh, we talked about this a little bit in lab. And I told you I didn't have the numbers memorized. I don't. I remember sand, silt, and clay only because, well, I, I use them with you guys uh, at least once a semester. So I don't expect you guys to memor remember them, memorize them, uh, the diameters at any rate. But we do uh, want you to remember the order, okay? Boulder the largest, clay the smallest. And remember, there is no end to how big, there's nothing bigger than a boulder. So it's kind of just a catch-all for anything bigger than 256 millimeters. Now, I know for a lot of us that means absolutely very little. We didn't grow up with metric. Uh, I could tell you that you could uh, move the decimal point over one notch and turn it into 25.6 centimeters. Does that help? Yeah, no. Uh, two and a half centimeters to the inch. Getting closer to helping. So it's not quite 12 inches or bigger. Probably closer to 10. Yeah, let's let's ask the, the all-knowing. How many inches is 256 millimeters? Ooh, damn, I'm good. 10 inches. So again, I argue that you guys would probably call that, if you had the word cobble in your vocabulary, you'd say, oh, look at that cobblestone. But more than likely, you'd just say rock, right? So boulder isn't nearly as big as we think it is. Um, cobble's just about right. Pebbles get bigger than we think. Sand gets bigger than we think. And smaller. Sand can get pretty fine, but it is still gritty. And then the silt and the clay. Again, apparently there is no end to how small clay can be. So here's a more formal definition for weathering. The breakdown of materials at the surface of the earth by the agents of weathering. We're introducing a new term here, the agents of. And you're going to see agents of weathering and you're going to see agents of erosion in a moment. most important thing here, though, is that weathering is simply the breakdown, the destruction, the making smaller pieces, all right? And that erosion, basically the same exact definition here, erosion is the transportation of that material you just made by the agents of erosion. So who are these agents? The agents of weather and erosion are one in the same, alas. They're double agents. Wind, water, ice, and gravity also rolls off the tongue. So now not only do you have boulder cobble pebbles, sand, silk, clay, you've got wind, water, ice, and gravity. Okay? Remember those two lists. Mumble them to yourself as you wander through the hallways. So, we got to talk about how they can be double agents. Um, let me see what the next slide is here. Yeah, well, let's keep going here. Uh, so, wind, water, ice, and gravity. We're going to now uh, talk about weathering and production of sediments. Yeah, no, I don't want to. I'm going to go a little ahead of my slides. Imagine that. But I just want to give you an example before we leave this of how this, this all works. And I think water really is a, uh, a great example here. Um, wind as well, but, but water is probably the best. Um, so we just talked a little bit ago about uh, a stream transporting gravel down a stream, down, down stream, right? Um, it's moving that rock from point A to point B. Well, you're also probably aware that that stream is also carving a ditch 
for lack of a better word, I can't think of the channel, there's the word, um, a channel into the ground. Streams grow, streams change over the years. So that is certainly weathering. We just talked about the stream transporting gravel, that's erosion, but the stream is weathering while it's transporting that gravel. And then not only that, this is more evident usually at a, a body of water that produces uh, waves, um, but definitely in, in streams as well. You'll notice that the majority of the rocks there are rounded, they're smooth, right? Uh, these are Mother Nature's rock tumblers. Whether it is something flowing along in a stream or rolling back and forth endlessly on the shoreline. And it's not exactly the water that's rounding those rocks. Again, we've kind of moved back to weathering that occurs during erosion, if you would. Because what's happening is that rock is tumbling back and forth on what? Other rocks, right? We're going to have a word for that in a, in a moment or two. It's rock against rock breakdown. But it happens in the stream while it's being transported. Okay? And, and I don't expect you to get too excited by that, but it is really the, the best example of, of how, you know, these are one and the same, whether they have original agents. Ice and gravity, you know, they do. Gravity, something falls, right? You have that uh, potential energy, they refer to it, uh, that, that energy due to their position, the top of the hill, for example. Something sets it loose, it will fall down slope, whether you're going straight off a cliff or rolling and tumbling down. That's gravity. Ice. Ice is a good one for double agenting as well. Um, glaciers carve. You guys, you know, growing up here in central New York, um, you're aware that you are in a glacial area. It carved the gorges in Ithaca that everybody travels to see. It, um, yeah, there you go. Well, we did the Mohawk Valley here, but it certainly, you know, helped. We got the river though, first and foremost, yeah. but, but yeah, um, it carved the, uh, the Finger Lakes, which used to be streams coming out of an old glacial lake there, uh, pre-glacial lake. Uh, it carved them super, super deep and then plugged off the beginning of them, and they turned into lakes instead of streams, and, and so on and so forth. So ice as a weathering agent, we get, and we're actually going to talk about another very specific thing that ice can do in a couple minutes, but also then... Glaciers, all of the uh, the riffraff that's around here, the, the the big boulders, the little boulders, the cobbles. If you've ever tried to dig in your backyard, okay, or driven through some farmers' fields up north, you see these rocks everywhere. Okay, as the glaciers melted, all of this stuff that they picked up along the way, like a big old blob or a big old jello mold, okay, it just slurps these things in. Sometimes we get to do the glacier chapter, sometimes we don't. So I got to talk a little bit about them here. But all this stuff it picks up along its journey, it melts out down here. Again, erosion. And then since we talked about the other three, we might as well hit wind as well. All right. uh, the wind, it well, it blows, right? Uh, now this one really sort of, water too has a limiter. The speed of the water, okay, how much water there is can kind of determine whether you're moving boulder, cobble, pebble, sand, silt, clay, right? Um, the wind, definitely, you know, hopefully you've never been to the beach and gotten pebbles blown into your face, right? That, that would really stink. Uh, but you get sand all the time. So sand is probably about, under normal circumstances, in quotes, the, the biggest thing that wind is ever going to move, okay? Silt and clay goes without saying. Now picture, if you can whether it's Roadrunner and Coyote or some cowboy movies you've seen, all that beautiful sculpted rock out west, okay? That is the wind blowing sand against rocks. It's Mother Nature being a sandblaster. Um, there is now wind being a weatherer. And of course, yeah, you can blow strong enough, I suppose, to break rock down, but that's, you know, again, not normal circumstances. 
So we, we walk this line between these things, moving things and breaking down things. And as I said, hopefully I've shown you now, it's sometimes it's one and the same. All right, let's get back to this slide. So production of sediments uh, weathering. There are two types of weathering, physical and chemical. Uh, a lot of times they'll call it mechanical. Um, a lot of times they've just gone to putting it in parentheses after physical. I, I don't know when they're going to drop the word mechanical, hopefully sometime soon. Um, but uh, we, we just have physical and chemical weathering that we talk about, that I refer to. So physical weathering is the physical breakdown of rock. Okay, could have figured that one. Uh, what this does is it breaks rock into smaller pieces. Not a big surprise, probably. Chemical weathering, on the other hand, is a little more. Oh, okay, we're going to talk about physical more. Sorry. Uh, I keep wanting to rearrange these slides, and I never do it. So two types of physical weathering. Abrasion and frost wedging. Abrasion is the one we were talking about just a moment ago. Abrasion is rock against rock breakdown. You take something you've been doing since you were old enough to pick up a rock, three years old, whatever, and you smash it into another rock and you get more pieces, right? That is abrasion. It's rock against rock breakdown. We just talked about the wind blowing sand and carving cool things out in the desert. We talked about Stones rolling around the bottom of a stream, banging into other stones and smoothing them out. That's another way. Those are all examples of abrasion. One of, geologically speaking, one of my favorite Roadrunner and Coyote cartoons is uh, he's standing at the top of a hill, as always, right? Uh, he's got a giant boulder, and his idea, of course, is to smush himself a Roadrunner. So he's got a Big old X on the ground, a pile of bird seed, and he's up at the top with a giant boulder. And I think this is like three scenes in, so he's already worked on the timing, whatever. So, bird stops, eats the seed, and he pushes that boulder down. And this time, between all the bouncing and banging and rolling and crunching that it does, by the time it actually gets down to the bottom where the bird seed pile was, it's a tiny little pebble because it broke down the whole way down. It's abrasion. Abrasion causes rounding. That's what we mentioned. You find those smooth stones uh, in the beach where there's waves. Even Lake Ontario, you don't need big waves. You just need a wave-producing body of water. You don't have to go to the ocean for this. Or streams with the constant water flowing. It just rounds those pebbles out over time. Remember when we tried to pretend that we cared about the difference between conglomerate and breccia in the lab? Okay. For sedimentologists, that actually means something. It means whether that sediment is really fresh, angular, or if it's been out there in the world for a while, smooth and rounded. So if they see a conglomerate, they talk about one kind of environment. If they see a breccia, they talk about a different kind. So that's abrasion. And as I indicate here, all agents are perfectly capable of doing that. Uh, and your textbook has a handful of others. I just cherry picked two of them. Uh, and then frost wedging. Frost wedging is very specific to uh, water. Frost wedging uh, deals with a fact that you probably learned fairly early in life, unless you guys grew up with a uh, ice maker in your refrigerator. I did not. It was a luxury back in the 80s. Um, and even now, to some extent. But I always remember as a kid going to get ice and wondering how the ice cubes were taller than the tray. Because I had enough trouble getting from the sink to... Well, there you go. I had enough trouble getting from the sink to the freezer without spilling these things after I'd fill them up, let alone, and I knew I did spill, let alone when I go to get it later, and the damn things are fuller than when I put them in. And she's absolutely right. Okay, the crystalline form of water, what we know as ice, takes up more room than the liquid form of water. It expands when it freezes. 
You learn that in a number of ways. Uh, maybe in your high school years, you tried to chill a beverage very rapidly in the freezer, perhaps. And you forgot about it because maybe you had too many beverages. And you realize that, oh my gosh, the dang thing blew up. It expands. So the same thing happens out here in Mother Nature. Water, the earth is old, she's cracked, right? It's all over the place, there's cracks. Water gets into those cracks. And especially this time of the year when it's really just bipolar season, right? You're 61 day, you're 32 days later. So you got all this water going down, trickling down into the earth, and the next day the dang thing's freezing. Turns into ice, it expands. Believe it or not, this is the hard part, you gotta believe that it is actually strong enough to pry that rock apart just a little bit. And then what happens is the next time that much more water could get in, that much more expansion happens. This is a very slow process. It's not always one season, hardly ever one season. But over time, that rock just gets wedged apart like you know, you're very, very, very slowly working at it with a crowbar. That's frost wedging. Now, we do have a wonderful example uh, in, our, in our civilized society, uh, thanks to snow plows. Okay, you guys are well aware of pothole season, right? So, again, water does the same thing on the blacktop. It gets into the cracks, it expands. But here you just need to lift a little crack because you got these multi-ton things barreling down the road, 35, 40 miles an hour, with these several ton plows in front of them. And all you have to do is just catch a corner that's lifted up and whoom! rips a big old chunk right out of it. Now don't get me wrong, I love the snow plows. We, we certainly, you know, depend on them. But, uh, but yeah, that's one of the big reasons for, for potholing. And one of the big reasons sometimes you show up back at your house, coming down your street, and you see these crazy little suture lines everywhere, because the road department had a little extra time that day, and they're sealing stuff up with Tar, rubber, whatever you want to call it. It's not rubber, but um, that's that that looks like black shiny paint. They're sealing up those cracks so water doesn't get in there. Looks bad for a couple weeks, couple months until the uh, you know gets all dirty again. But you look, you'll see this spring. They'll go through and they'll do that here and there. And like I said, they're sealing up those cracks so it, it helps maintain it. So abrasion and frost wedging, two examples of physical weathering, and um, there are more. Rounding's important. Okay, finally now chemical weathering. Uh, chemical weathering is the chemical breakdown of a rock. Remember, uh, physical weathering was the physical breakdown, so again, not a huge definitional stretch here. Uh, but instead of making smaller pieces, what this is doing is this is dissolving a rock. And we alluded to this when we uh, talked about chemical sedimentary rocks, okay? Uh, we talked about how seashells of the critters, when they die and they fall to the bottom of the ocean, they start to dissolve. That calcite goes into the water, remember, it precipitates back out as a sedimentary rock, limestone in this example, okay? Um, but that you could also dissolve pre-existing limestone. And it isn't even just limestone, all right? We could be talking about um, uh, your car. Okay, oxidation. Oxidation is a fancy term for rusting, or more correctly, rusting is one type of oxidation. That is degradation. Cars aren't made as, as much metal as they used to be. Believe me, there used to be some junkers going around. Okay, you used to call them beater cars. Around here, you guys call them winter cars. And, uh, but now there's so much plastic and uh, fender, or not fenders, bumpers. Definitely, you know, you hardly ever see metal bumpers. Everything's got a plastic facade on it. But uh, bumpers, when they were back in the days of chrome, um, definitely you saw a lot, a lot, a lot of rust. And um, that was obviously breaking down, right? 
Uh, another example, if uh, you go to your grandma's house maybe, and she's got a silver tea set out or some old silverware, um, it oxidizes. Oxidation is destruction. Um, way back when, um, wife and I used to go uh, antiquing on Sunday. She just like, you know, it's a good way to kill some time. We didn't have any hardly any money. Uh, so you wander around these, these places and uh, see like different silverware and you know, plates and cups and, well, not cups, but bowls and stuff like that. And of course, the more oxidized and older the stuff was looking, the cheaper it was. So that's what we'd, we'd get to buy. And slowly but surely, over time, we started to realize that the more these things were oxidized, the more likely we were to find like actual little pits into the surface. And I was given this lecture, you know, like the next Monday or something, one day after we'd done that, and she was all bummed out because this, what would have been a really cool silver platter or some such thing, just had a whole bunch of pock marks on it. And I'm like, holy crap, that's oxidation. It really is destructive. You know, it just dawned on me all of a sudden. We just, you know, I'd had this knowledge, but I didn't apply it kind of thing. So chemical weathering isn't as always as, as obvious as dissolving is. I mean, that's obviously destruction. Um, but even oxidation is destructive. And there's just, I don't know, another slide that says the same thing. Oh, just a reminder, I guess, in this case, that dissolving is going into solution, okay? We talked about this with chemical sedimentary rocks coming out of solution, or what we call precipitating. Dissolving is going into solution. All right, so we're done with weathering. Erosion, the movement of sediments. And a lot of this is going to be re... Uh, re uh, you're going to... Because I talked about it without the slides a couple minutes ago. Wind blows and water flows. All right? Something else that sort of rhymes to remember. We got... Boulder, cobble, pebble, sand, silt, clay, wind, water, ice, and gravity. Wind blows and water flows. And glaciers plop. That is their word, not mine. You were wondering about gravity earlier. I just said, you know, I was talking about stuff falling. Remember landslides? Oh, yeah, landslides. That's an amazing example of, of gravity um, being a, an eroder as well as a weatherer. So this is how these agents move things. Remember, erosion is movement. All right. If you still haven't put it all together, weathering produces sediments. Erosion transports sediments. And, dun, 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 Sedimentary rocks are made of sediments. Couldn't have a better synopsis if you tried. All right, so as I said, there is a couple um, terms that we just really need to, to think through here. Um, rounding, we already mentioned. Rounding are those um, sharp edges, the angular bits that wear down during erosion, typically. But that is weathering. Rounding is weathering, but it is caused by erosion. And if you think about it, those sharp bits, they're usually thin, right? That's why they're sharp. That's why you could, you know, let's say you could cut your shelf on it, but you know what I mean. We wouldn't call them pointy and, and all that if they weren't thin pieces already. And, and that's why they're that much more likely to break off, you see. And as I implied uh, to those that care, 
whether or not something is rounded or how rounded something is, though there are degrees of rounding, believe me, uh, indicates potentially how long something's been out there in the environment. And yes, they take into account what the material is, quartz pebbles, pieces of church obviously last longer than, you know, biotite mica and stuff like that, right? A uh, piece of granite that might be incorporated into a rock is going to be a whole lot more resilient than a piece of sandstone or limestone that was incorporated into another rock. Remember that rock cycle? We're still really in just a super tiny loop in that upper corner of the rock cycle, round about one or two o'clock. All right, moving on to deposition. Putting the stuff down. As erosion ends, deposition occurs, or deposition begins, right? Um, oftentimes, we see that sediments are deposited by size, and there's a really great reason for this. It's called physics. And um, what we see is that, and this is you know kind of a clumsy sentence maybe, but uh, this is all controlled by the velocity of the erosional agent or what I more often than not refer to as system energy. How much energy is in the system? Remember how we mentioned, and you guys sort of nodded along with me, that the stronger the wind blew, the bigger pieces it could blow around, right? Maybe you could get hit by a pebble one day on the beach if the wind was blowing strong enough. Or we said that on a normal day, um, streams are carrying pebbles, sand, silt, and clay, but you could imagine a stream getting full enough and big enough and then subsequently fast enough that it might start moving bigger rocks along. That's what we're talking about. That's that system energy. That's that velocity. The more energy there is, obviously, the bigger something can move. We all get that, right? All right. Well, the same exact thing works in opposite. As something slows down, it is then less capable of moving those big things. So if something is the last thing to be picked up, it's going to be the first thing that gets dropped. Because you're going right back down that energy hill. So then what happens is, let's say that stream has been flowing strong enough to carry gravel sand, silt, and clay, even though gravel isn't an official class size in here. But we all know what gravel is. All right, it's flowing along, trucking down a mountain, and just carrying everything it can with it. As Soon as it hits the bottom of that mountain and it levels out, what do you think the first thing is that's going to be dropped? The heaviest stuff it picked up, right? Because it's losing energy. So the gravel, boom, falls out. Then it flows a little farther keeps slowing down because you're just hitting the plains now. Then what falls out? The next heaviest thing, all the sand, and you get a big old sand deposit. And then usually silts and clays stay till you hit the water, the like a pond or the ocean, wherever you're headed. And and yeah, oceans, you know, move back and forth, but it is the equivalent of hitting a brick wall compared to being a stream. All right, it's just, it really is no movement. And this is why, again, if you've spent any time poking around out in, in non-groomed nature, um, you tend to get mud when you go out into the lakes and whatnot. All right, all the heavier sediment is deposited, bigger sediments deposited a ways back. Again, think about a beach. Again, unfortunately, most of them are groomed, but if you go to like a state park or something like that, they're a little less so. You've got the sand on the shoreline, right? If you could walk out far enough without being underwater, you would hit clays and silts. And if you went back the other direction, what should be on the other side of the sand? Well, all the gravel. Now, coincidentally, that happens to be where the parking lots usually are, but that's not Mother Nature's gravel there, okay? Um, but that's where it should be. So you see this progression, this environmental progression. We're starting, this is the cool thing. This is why I, I dig sedimentary rocks so much is they actually, they are made by the environment. Um, I've mentioned probably a handful of times over the semester, I don't didn't focus on this, I didn't focus on that. I'm um, surface processes and critters. This is, this is my thing here. 
uh, and part of that is going back and interpreting um, old environments. And you can really tell a lot by a rock. I know you guys are struggling just to remember, recognize the damn things. But uh, once you get used to it and you know, you know what it's made from and this only comes from certain environments and so on and so forth, you can start to do some really cool stuff with it. So anyhow, I meandered a bit there. Uh, sorting and deposition. Okay, deposition is controlled by the erosional agent. Going back to gravity for a minute, you're falling off a cliff. There's not a whole lot of slowing down there, right? So at the bottom of these cliffs, quite often, you just get a jumbled mess. There's no opportunity for sorting there. But wind and water, yeah, they sort like crazy. All right, and this is probably just going to summarize what I said, so probably won't want to write it down. Velocity or system energy is responsible for sorting out sediment by size. As erosion ends, deposition occurs. Largest size deposits first, then smaller and smaller material. Yeah, that's exactly what we just said. Got it, Tim. I'm going to switch slides. Okay. All right. And again, this PowerPoint represents uh, just a snapshot of an entire semester of a class, believe it or not. Um, sedimentology, if you were like a junior in geology, um, you, you would have 14 glorious weeks of this stuff. Um, and, and this is one of the things, I know a lot of your classes, stuff might feel knowledge-wise, okay? Um, we really just have to kind of jump from concept to concept to concept. Um, every so often things apply to other chapters, but we're, we're really, it's sort of a, the curse of an introductory course oftentimes, um, where we just, you know, got to introduce so many concepts to you that you hardly ever get a chance to apply them. But this is, this is certainly one that, that does live on. Um, once you're deposited, uh, basically you're at a fork in the road. And we've already taken one fork, one, one of those paths. Um, that sediment can undergo consolidation and lithification and turn into a rock, right? Sedimentary rock. And we, we did that uh, first conversationally this time. Uh, the other option is that this sediment could just sit there and life can happen on it and in it. Look out your window one of these days when the snow's gone and you see that it is covered by sediment. Now around here we've got plenty of vegetation that goes on to cover that sediment. And in fact, that's why if you go to uh, you know your geology major anywhere from the east coast to practically the Midwest, they send you out west for what we call field camp uh, because the vegetation, there's hardly any vegetation out there. So you can actually see all the stuff that you just spent four years talking about. Um, there's a few places, obviously you guys, you know, being by the Adirondacks here, um, you get to see some of that. You get um, special uh, access to glaciers, uh, environments, Okay, that they don't get out west. But almost everything else you learn, it's really hard to see around here. So we're talking, as I said, it can remain unconsolidated and become a soil, get enriched with nutrients. Soils are another one of those chapters that we don't always get to in the semester. We don't think we're gonna get to it this semester, all right? So we'll just say real quick here, what's the difference between dirt and soil or sediments and soil? Short answer is nutrients. All right, you're not gonna plant a pretty flower or a tree just in plain old dirt. It doesn't work, you gotta go, you gotta go to the soil and do what? You know, your topsoil, your potted soil, whatever you and your, your family call it. You gotta put fertilizer in there, da 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 da. So, that's another road that it can take. And again, this leads us off into two different PowerPoints, potentially.
Now, we are not taking that either of those rows now um, because when we come back on uh, the next class, we're going to start something called stratigraphy, stratigraphy, a lot of you guys say. Um, and this talks about the layering of the rocks, how those rock layers got there, what they can imply, what you probably shouldn't imply, and uh, if you have ever spent some time either as a passenger or as a driver driving down the throughway and looking out the window at those rocks uh, or taking 80 whatever it is once you get to Albany and heading south down to Poughkeepsie and all that and you see those rocks out your windows or you've gone up into the Adirondacks and you see the rock layers up there. If you ever paid any attention to that, well that's the kind of stuff we'll be talking about. What you can or can't say about that, why it looks the way it does, and so on and so forth. And uh, it's, it's kind of a cool thing. We talked a little bit about geologic time while we're doing that. Um, so, yeah. And then after we do that, believe it or not, it'll be time for test three. we got to spend like 10 minutes on metamorphic rocks, but, but otherwise. So test three is coming a little quicker than, than two or certainly one did. Where's my mouse? Oh, you can't even see that. Okay, folks at home, sorry, I'm having trouble finding my mouse so I can't stop the timer. <laughs>